Welcome to the uh, 13th in my series of recorded lectures for the subject of ETC 1000, thinking a little bit about examining differences between uh, the means of, uh, or estimated means of uh, different subpopulations and whether or not they represent something uh, significant and uh, important or whether it's simply a, a minor difference due to random chance. Let's go and have a look at our slides and some examples to see what we're talking about here. So we're talking about uh, predictive analytics and trying to make use of a sample of data to get some insight into what's going on with the population. Um, but first of all, sort of a more fundamental question is why would we want to compare across groups? Well, it's a very important uh, in many situations, for example, to identify subgroups of the population who've got different experiences that might require particular attention. You're trying to target a public health campaign and you realise that uh, certain parts of the population are more in need of that. Really. Just to give you a trivial example, I was looking at some statistics for East Timor the other day and uh, your average adult female uh, aged between sort of 15 and 49, uh, about 3 to 5 percent of those are smokers. For males, it is 61 percent. So that is a huge difference across those two subgroups, females and males. So if you're going to try and target uh, the population to try and reduce the prevalence of smoking, then you need a campaign that's going to work with men because that's where the problem lies. That's an example of, uh, of why you want to know about those differences in groups. You might want to look at possibility of discrimination, for example, if you see that a particular uh, group of people are, are more likely to uh, find difficulties getting employment or uh, getting promoted in their jobs and so on, whether that's due to gender or, or ethnic background or and so on, then you can identify those by looking at subpopulations and uh, also to think about whether treatments are effective. So you might uh, uh, have a group of people who you put in your treatment group and then you have another group which you call the control group and this is often how uh, we examine whether or not a particular program works and by comparing the outcomes for those not in the treatment with those who are in the treatment then we can see whether or not the treatment actually works. So in this particular example here you'll see that we've got the control group here. We've actually looked at the treatment group in two categories, those less than a year and those greater than a year. And this represents the economic burden of uh, addiction uh, amongst the control group, which is much higher than it is for the treatment groups. So as this tells us that uh, this particular treatment, whatever it is, is actually reducing the burden uh, on society of, of drug addiction. So yeah tells us the treatment's kind of saving us this much money, for example, in the first year, and then it's saving this much money after a year. So therefore we know whether or not it's worth investing in that program. This is all achievable by looking at the mean for one group or, and the mean for another group, or in this case, three different groups, and asking the question whether or not um, the, uh, the treatment is working. So that's why we compare across groups. We, uh, In terms of the kinds of things that we're interested in here, we think about the problem as we have with all of the others here is that we've got a population parameter that we're interested in and in this case we might for example be looking at the difference in means between two populations, subpopulations, males versus females, uh, those who received the treatment versus those who didn't etc. And we learn about that, this column all of course is unknown, by taking a sample and getting the sample analogue to those population parameters, the sample statistics, which would be the mean of the sample for males and the mean of the sample for females, or the mean for those treated and those not treated. Other things that you might want to do to compare across groups is look at the differences in proportions. Is the proportion of people uh, who uh, suffer from this illness bigger in this category than that, for example, and, and other possible comparisons. But we're going to introduce most of the ideas by looking at this difference in means. Do males go to the doctors? doctor less often than females. So we've got some data on doctor's visits and we've got whether a person is a male or a female. So if we could calculate the mean number of doctor's visits for this sample for males and compare it to the mean number of doctor's visits for females, then essentially we'd be able to look at the difference between those two and get some idea about whether that reflects a difference in the population values. So here's the mean for males average 1.87, for females 2.68, so there's quite a big difference between those two, 0.811. Looks big, but the question we have to ask, which we've uh, 
is is that this is just based on a sample. And so sometimes, when you, always when you take a sample randomly, you're going to get a difference between two subpopulation, two subsamples. The numbers are never going to be exactly, you know, 2.003 or whatever to the three decimal places. So you have to ask the question: Is that difference big, or is it? And is it driven by systematic differences between males and females, or is it just due to chance, the sort of random difference? So the answer to that question is found by constructing a confidence interval in one case, and also by hypothesis testing in another case. So let me think a bit more about that with you. So first of all, when it comes to uh, how we do this in regression, we uh, no, go ahead. I, sorry, just had an interruption to my left. Sorry. Um, we might un uh, fit a model something like the following uh, here, where what we've done is we've constructed a regression similar to what you might have seen in, in other cases, where the dependent variable is how many times a person goes to the doctor, and we've got two variables in the model. We've got whether the person's fem the, 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 an intercept, and then we've got a, a dummy variable for indicating that the person is a male. So I'll just quickly take you across to uh, an Excel sheet here and show you what it looks like in practice. So here's the dependent variable, doctor's visits, and we're going to take this variable here, male, female, and we're going to do a simple regression. So I'll, I'll do it with you now if you like. So make them a bit bigger. Data analysis regression. OK. The Y range is doctor's visits which we happen to know to be 1, 2, 2, 2. And the X range is E1, to E1, 2, 2, 2. We've got labels on the top row. So we tick that box. And we want a constant. So then we just say OK. And out comes the answers here. So you'll see, when you look at these numbers, they look familiar. Take you back to the PowerPoint now. And recall we calculated the mean for females to be 2.682. That happens to be precisely the coefficient of the intercept in this equation here. And we found a difference between males and females of 0.811, which is precisely, to three decimal places anyway, the coefficient of that male dummy. So we can actually extract out those quantities from this regression. Essentially what you're doing is you've got a model like this. And if x equals 0, that says you're a female. So you get y hat equals just that. So the mean of y in the case of females is simply by get given by the intercept, which is this number here, 2.68. If a person is a male, which means you're, then x equals 1, so then y hat equals b0 plus b1x. So subtract the, the value, so the predicted value, the mean for males, is given by this quantity here. So subtract, sorry, because x equals 1, then we don't have the x, so we just get b0 plus b1, my mistake. Subtract this one minus this one, so you, let's call it y hat m and y hat f. The predicted mean for males minus females, and you get beta naught plus beta one minus beta one, so you just get beta one. So the male variable, the coefficient of that dummy, is the difference between males and females in the sample. We can then go straight over here to the confidence interval, and we can say that we are now 95% sure that the average difference between males and females is somewhere between 0.38 and 0.12 with males being below females. So 95% confidence males pay between 0.386 and 1.235 less visits to the doctor than females. So we're pretty sure that men go to the doctor less. Okay, At least 0.386 times less, but possibly as much as 1.2 times less per every three months. There's another way we can sort of get this handle on the, the uncertainty in the analytics, and that is by something called hypothesis testing. And I'm going to introduce hypothesis testing here in the context of uh, this difference in groups because it's the ideal place, but hypothesis testing can be 
performed on any of the population parameter that we might be interested in, going back to the original slide here. We could do a hypothesis test about the mean of a proportion, etc. But we can introduce it in the context of difference between means because it's a very natural place to use a hypothesis test. What we're doing with hypothesis testing is formulating some kind of hypothesis about a population parameter and then we use the evidence in the sample to see if, if the, we uh, can accept that hypothesis or if there's evidence to, against it. So we, in hypothesis testing we have what's called a null hypothesis which is a conservative view that we take uh, about what the truth is and uh, then we have an alternative hypothesis which is the alternative view against which we're testing the null. So we're looking to see whether there's any evidence against the conservative view. Science, the scientific method basically uses hypothesis testing and it's intrinsic in the scientific method. But it's a relatively conservative type of approach. We don't believe something's true unless we can find convincing evidence of it. So we go with the conservative view first and then we look for evidence to reject it. So in this case the conservative view is that there's really no difference between men and women. The average population mean of the number of visits is the same, the population mean for the number of visits is the same for males and females. The alternative view that we're looking to see whether we can find evidence for is that there's a difference between males and females. Now that's about the population. We use a sample to examine that question. So the sample means are different, of course, in every case, but is that difference big enough to provide us with enough evidence to say there is a difference in the population means. That's a big question, a big statement, so you've got to get your head around that. In shorthand, what we reword that question into is, is that difference statistically significant? And that's what we mean by statistically significant. Big enough to provide statistical evidence to support the view that there is a difference in population means. That's what hypothesis testing does. The mechanics of, of where the, the, the numbers come from we we'll look at in the future, but for now the way we do the hypothesis test is pretty straightforward. We simply rely on this number here which is called a p-value. That's an indicator of whether this difference in the means, sample difference, difference in the sample means, is so far from zero that we should uh, reject the null hypothesis that the, that the difference would actually be zero in the population sense. And a small number of that p-value indicates that it is indeed a long way from zero. It's kind of like a probability statement about the chances of such a value occurring uh, if the truth was zero. And so therefore a small value indicates that's a very unlikely prospect if the null hypothesis was true and therefore we reject the null hypothesis. The chances of this occurring by chance is 0.0001 which is very small. We have a rule of thumb that says if it's less than 5%, in fact, or 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis. So that's how if we do it in practice, pretty straightforward. So in other words, we come to the conclusion here that there is strong evidence in the data to say that men go to the doctor, do not go to the doctor the same number of times as women on average. How does it work? Well, this is the definition of a p-value. It is the probability of a value that we got from our sample, we got, a, we got a difference between means here of minus 0.81, what's the chances of that occurring or getting a value of difference which is further from zero of 0.81 or, or more, either in the positive or the negative direction, assuming the truth is in the population that there's no difference. So assuming H0 was true, what's the chances of getting a value like this from your sample? And the answer is the p-value. So if you get, and the mathematics of that is based on the idea of the sampling distribution which we introduced in a previous video if you've, if you've watched earlier ones. Sampling distribution of x bar gives us a probability statement about the probability of getting this particular x bar in our sample or, or bigger or sorry or further from zero and on the basis of that we can construct something called a p-value. So a small p-value is suggesting that H0 is less likely to be true. It's extremely unlikely that you would have got this value were H0 true. So therefore it is evidence against H0 or evidence in favour of H1. So if P, this slightly satirical t-shirt here, if P was too small, less than the arbitrary number we make up which is 0.05, or it never happened. In other words, H0 is not true. 
slightly um, uh, not precisely accurate statement, but some kind of daggy T-shirt that a statistician might wear. Okay, so that's what a p-value is all about. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, we can we can go through a little bit of the theory of it here just to give you an idea about where it comes from. But it's it's uh, at practical level very simple to apply. Simply get the appropriate output, look at it compared to some arbitrary cutoff like five percent, and decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. So as I th said, the theory comes from uh, the sampling distribution story. And, and so to, to show you very briefly how the theory derives, we'll go back to a simpler problem. Suppose I wanted to test a, a mean of a, something, a mean equaling zero. So I take a sample, get a mean, and call it x bar from my sample. Now we know the sampling distribution of x bar. We know what the distribution of x bar would be if I did many, many samples. It would be that there normally distributed with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared on n. Not sure where that comes from, then there's a previous video that talks about that. So if H0 was true, then the mean is zero of the population, so X bar would follow this distribution. So we can, with our particular X bar, from our particular sample, we put a little subscript on that to indicate that's the X bar I got from this particular sample, X bar is, work out a probability statement. We can work out the probability that the sample mean is bigger than the one that I observed from my sample, given the distribution of x bar. So that's just a normal distribution probability. If we know the variance, which we can estimate with the sample, and we've got to not use normal, we've actually got to use students t because we've estimated the variance, so there's that extra bit of uh, complication, which we have again referred to earlier when we talked about confidence intervals, then we can calculate that probability. Uh, and Again, we're not going to go through the precise details of how we do that. What I want you to get at this point is just to understand where that p-value has come from. So we have, under the null hypothesis, we have a mean of zero. We have an x-bar, therefore. This is the probability distribution of x-bar, this curve here. And I get a particular value of x-bar here. What I want to do is work out what's the chances of a value like that occurring, that one or further from the null. If there's a very small chance of that occurring. That indicates that my x bar is, is a long way from zero, which would be evidence against the null hypothesis. If it was quite close to zero, then I'd have a fairly high chance of a value like that occurring or bigger, and uh, that would be evidence in favour of the null. I'm just going to put uh, that there so that you don't get confused at some future point. But in fact, we don't look at only in that direction, we also look in the opposite direction. So it's as far or further from the null, to be precise. It's a minor detail. For now, just get the idea of where a p-value comes from, and therefore how we can use it to draw the conclusion, in this particular case here, that there is indeed a statistically significant difference between the average number of doctor's visits for males than for females. Uh, this difference that we observed in our sample is extremely unlikely to have occurred by chance. And that gives you some idea about how unlikely. Okay, that's enough uh, introduction to hypothesis testing. I hope that you uh, found that made sense, and uh, we will uh, stop there. Bye.